co-host now. Somebody did it. I did it, yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Who else? Yep. Yeah. So should I share my screen? Yes. Yeah, I will stop sharing. So just uh, briefly for everybody, welcome back to the second uh, Atlantic session, the third session of PyHat 2020. Uh, we've got um, a few very exciting talks today focused, focused on the analysis fundamentals and platforms. Uh, we have our second keynote here with uh, David Straub. Um, and for everyone that hasn't joined yesterday, there is a link to Slido where we will be posting, where you can post your questions. Uh, we will at the end, I think, take those questions based on the number of upvotes uh, that they've received. And depending on how much time we have, we may or may not be able to get to all of them, but we'll bring them onto Slack afterwards. Um, and yes, I think that's everything. David, over to you. All right. So can you see the screen? Yeah, that's very good. Excellent. So uh, just to let you know, uh, this is a um, Jupyter notebook um, that I'm using for the presentation. And uh, I forgot to put the link for the, uh, for the repository on the slides. Actually, maybe I can do that right now. So if you want to look something up, you can do it immediately. All right, there we are. So thanks a lot for having me. So uh, when I got the invitation for this talk, I thought that's a very interesting opportunity to share some of the experience that I made with using Python in my research. And the title I chose, Python and High Energy Physics, a perfect match in theory, is actually a pun because I like bad puns. Um, so one of the meanings is that, um, you know, in theoretical physics, which is um, my area of research, um, Python is very useful as, as I tried to show you during this talk. And I assume that the majority of the conference participants are actually in experimental physics. Um, but on the other hand, another meaning of the title is that, you know, in practice, in particular in theoretical physics, there are also some challenges and I want to tell you about them in the end. Now, before I talk about Python, um, I want to say something about my affiliation because it's a bit unusual. So uh, I hope you forgive me if I start a bit off topic with a, a short slide telling you about myself so you know um, who I am. So uh, actually until last year, um, I was leading a junior research group on the interplay between direct and indirect searches for physics beyond the standard model um, in Munich. And so I did research mostly on beyond the standard model physics, flavor physics, effective field theories and all that. And of course, um, I used a lot of Python, especially in recent years, and published various open source tools. Um, then um, after my uh, grant ended last year, I went for a few months to a um, data science consulting startup called Omega Lambda Tech. From the name, you can already tell that it was founded by astrophysicists. So actually all of my colleagues were astrophysicists. And that was very interesting because um, I learned how the methods and the tools that we use in fundamental physics can be applied to all kinds of interesting pro um, problems like uh, smart energy, smart mobility, and all that. And um, now I'm working for a company called Lilium. Um, maybe you've heard about it. Um, we're working on a very exciting project, in my opinion. We're developing an all electric vertical takeoff and landing jet, that is shown here which um, in just a couple of years from now should connect cities of up to 300 kilometers distance in less than one hour. So for the people at CERN, just imagine having a landing pad in front of the CERN main entrance, hopping into one of our craft and then going to let's say Zurich or Milan in less than one hour. So I think that's very exciting. And obviously with zero is emissions and low noise. That's of course the topic for a different talk. Here I just want to mention that um, it's very fascinating actually when you start working on such problems which at first sight seem very different from particle physics. You know, it turns out that the mathematical and the data-driven problems that we face are actually very similar. So we can use a lot of the methods from high energy physics. All right, but now um, back to Python. So since I just told you that I uh, worked uh, with, with astrophysicists, I found it interesting that they told me that Python really has become the dominant language in their field. And this is shown by this plot, which I generated, of course, uh, with Python. So here there's a Jupyter notebook where I just 
pinged the uh, Inspire API for search terms, different programming languages um, for different years. Um, it's not complete because I wasn't able to search for C or C++ because it's just too short. But anyway, I mean, it gives you the idea that Python uh, really is becoming dominant in astrophysics until a few years ago, an obscure thing called IDL was still dominant that I hadn't even heard about before talking to astrophysicists. And um, so this is a success story. And I think part of the success is due to um, the AstroPy package, which is a big uh, community Python package developed by a lot of astrophysicists. Um, and the reason, part of the reason why I'm showing you this is to show you that in uh, high energy physics phenomenology, which is my field, or was my field, I should say, um, the situation is actually different. So um, this is the corresponding plot for the HEP PH archive category. And um, you can see that, you know, when I entered the field, actually as a master's student, among these ones, which do not include C and C++, Fortran was actually the dominant language. So actually a, lo a lot of the codes that I had to use as a master and PhD students were really Fortran codes. Um, and nowadays you can see that Python, you know, is on the rise but it's not dominant. There's also Mathematica, which is still very popular. And so before actually um, talking about Python, I want to talk a little bit about why Mathematica is so popular in phenomenology. So why are people using Mathematica in phenomenology? And also I used to use Mathematica for many years exclusively. The first reason I think is simplicity. Mathematica is exceedingly simple. If you just want to you know, plot the sine of x squared from zero to four pi, you just type it like this and you're done. So I would argue that this is even simpler than doing it in Python. Secondly, and this is very important, uh, it's interactive. So you don't have to just write source code and then execute it, but you can, you can do it in a notebook interface. And this is extremely useful when you're doing uh, phenomenology. And third, um, you can not only do numerical calculations, but also symbolical, um, you know, mathematics. And this, you know, even though I like SymPy and I've used SymPy, um, Mathematica is, is very, very strong and is very hard to beat. Nevertheless, many phenomenologists also use Mathematica for numerical analysis. And, and here, I think this is the point where Python really can, can you know, take over a large, large fraction. So, um, Sorry. So here I listed the reasons why I think uh, using Mathematica for numerical phenomenology um, has many problems. And those are all of those points are actually pain points that I suffered a lot um, in the past before switching to Python. So first of all, it's, it's not really possible to do object oriented programming. So maybe there's some way to do it, but it's, it's certainly not obvious. So, you know, it's very hard in my opinion and also from codes I've looked at to write pretty Mathematica code. And then there's the licensing issue. So, well, of course your university pays for your license and so there's no problem. But then when you think about, you know, running, you know, a hundred kernels in parallel on a computing cluster, you know, this is not impossible, but it gets really complicated and it's very annoying. Um, you also cannot simply, you know, test your code in continuous integration on Travis CI or, or something or run it in your Docker container. All of that is just very complicated or even impossible because of this licensing. And finally, I think the biggest problem of Mathematica and also then already uh, the advantage of Python is, you know, there is no package manager, but there is not, not only no package manager, but there is not even a standard that I'm aware of of sharing your, your packages, let alone an infrastructure or dependency resolution or anything like that. So um, just for fun, I want to show you um, a real life installation instruction from a phenomenology and Mathematica package, which is, is a very good package. Actually, I used it myself and I respect the authors very much. So I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but just to show you how complicated it is. So to install this package, which depends on another package, um, you have to download them both as tarballs. You have to unzip them to a certain directory, move one directory into a subdirectory of the first one, rename it to something including the version string, edit the configuration file, changing the absolute path to your system, open a notebook, run it, then 
uh, quit the kernel, start it again, and run a different module. Okay, then you're done. So uh, it's a nightmare. And you know, again, this is not the author's fault. It's just uh, very complicated. Another shocking example that I wanted to share, this is actually a, a, a snippet of code that I wrote myself uh, for my first paper. So what we did there was we, we had some analysis code in Mathematica, of course, and we had to run a different package called CP SuperHix. Maybe you've heard about it. Um, it's, it used to be actually quite popular. It's a Fortran code. It has you know, this uh, very modern looking website. And um, we had to call this code from our Mathematica function. And you know, because there's no uh, interface or whatsoever um, between these codes, what I had to do was you know, generate temporary files, concatenate all the input parameters into a string, um, pipe that into a script, run a ch mod in the shell to make the script executable, uh, run the script in the shell, but return zero if the, shell, if the script doesn't finish within three seconds, and then pass it back again. So it, it's, you know, it's very embarrassing, but just to, to convey to you why this is a nightmare and why actually switching to Python was, you know, was almost like a revelation for me. So uh, another thing that we used for the same paper, so we had to, well, we wanted to use a uh, Minuit. So we wanted to use the Migrat routine to minimize a function that we had defined in Mathematica. So we had to call Mathematica from root and you know, it worked, but it, it was a total nightmare. Right, so why uh, did I switch to Python? Well, first of all, there are two things that I already had and that I wanted to keep. The first is simplicity um, and the second is interactivity, as I told you. So I think Jupyter is really crucial and, and really a killer feature of Python, which, you know, without which uh, I would have probably not, not easily switched over from Mathematica. But then apart from these two check marks, there are so many things that you gain, right? You can run it everywhere you want uh, on a computing cluster, continuous integration, all that. Um, there are so many libraries to use and it's easy to use them. You, know, you don't have to start downloading things and copying them in some obscure directory. You can use state-of-the-art software development practices like um, you know, test-based development and all that. You know, and that boosted my, my productivity so much. Um, and, you know, but not only that, but it's also easy to modify. And this, you know, I think is a, is a big advantage compared to, you know, C++ or Fortran is that you don't have to modify something, recompile, try to uh, see what, what changed, but you can, you know, you can just monkey patch a method in, in any library and see what comes out. And this for a phen phenomenologist is a very useful thing. Um, I saw there was a raised hand, but I'm not sure how I can take questions. Um, maybe you can just unmute yourself. If that works. I think you're okay, David. I, it's, um, I oh, think we can take is, them in the end. We, we had some people, yeah, to make co hosts. So I, I think you're fine. Keep going. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Right. But of course, you know, what's also really great and, and much easier is that you can much more easily share code. You can collaborate and you can, you know, split your code into different modules, importing each other and so on. But something which is very, very crucial, I think, is that it's easy to install compared to the example I just showed you. And maybe just a short anecdote. So I remember having a three hour uh, tutorial at a graduate school about a Python code. And, you know, the first slide was um, install. Um, and, and the slide just said pip install Flavio. And, um, you know, it was very fast. Admittedly, it didn't work um, for every student immediately. So I remember there were, there was one student who had a Windows laptop uh, with a, what was it, a, a Python 2 executable named Python 3.exe. So that was, that took some time to fix. But, you know, apart from that, uh, it was really fast. And there was another uh, colleague doing a tutorial about a, you know, very elaborate uh, C++ uh, software suit. And um, I think uh, most of the three hours were actually needed to, to make that compile on, on every student's computer. So I think this is a huge um, benefit of Python. And finally, uh, you get plots with proper LaTeX labels, which is, which is great. And I'm only half joking here. So this is really, um, I think, a nice feature. 
Um, so, okay, uh, just a single slide where I want to say that, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, criticism I sometimes hear from people not using Python is that they, for some reason, think uh, Python is slow. But it turned out that um, all the codes that I ported from Mathematica to Python turned out to be much, much faster. And the reason is not that, you know, the you know, underlying algorithms or, or anything are, are faster, but the reason is uh, what I want to demonstrate here, that you can use things like SnakeVis, which is a really, really nice visualization library for, for profiling, you know, to profile where your code actually uses up all its time. And, you know, so many times in developing software, I've encountered, you know, time eaters and methods where I didn't expect and which, which brought me a factor of 10 speed up of my code. If you're using, you know, Mathematica or something like that, you will never find these time eaters. All right, so then uh, back to, back to uh, what happened when I switched to Python. So, you know, around this time, you know, I started um, doing all my phenomenology in Python and uh, we ended up doing so I had two young and very talented PhD students. We ended up doing a project on composite Higgs models um, where we did, you know, a very big numerical analysis with running Markov chain Monte Carlos in a computing cluster, storing a huge amount of data in an SQL database and, and all that. And that would have been completely impossible with the tools I had used before. So um, it made me very happy. But, you know, Python, I think, is not just great um, because it's a, a computing tool, it's a programming language, but also because it facilitates, you know, open uh, collaboration. And um, so the next step in my usage of Python was actually when I started um, using it for open source projects. And the motivation back then was actually a controversy that, you know, people working in flavor physics um, probably heard about. Um, so there are these deviations from standard model expectations in this rare BDK mode, B2K, so B plus or minus, which started showing up around 2013. So here's this, a screenshot from the LHCB website. They speculated about hints at new physics and some theorist colleagues even you know, were confident to say that those are first experimental science of new physics. Maybe they're right, we don't know yet. But the thing is that there were several theory groups back then fighting about who had the right um, predictions and especially also the right error bars. And the two, the two groups that were fighting most, you know, most, most uh, vividly actually didn't, um, you know, disclose the code they used to do their numerical analysis. So I thought it's funny, like they're fighting and um, claiming that to each other that their analysis was wrong, but nobody knew what they were actually doing. And so the idea was uh, to come up with a Python code, which transparently compares the different methods and is open source, it's easy to use and easy to extend and serves as a basis for discussion. And um, this was when you know, the Flavio project started, this is what I call it. And you know, it developed into, well, ecosystem is maybe a bit exaggerated, but it evolved into a family of tools um, for, um, had phenomenology. So Flavio started off actually as a flavor physics phenomenology package and it evolved into more than that actually. So it's a general uh, effective field theory observable calculator nowadays. Then um, we realized that, you know, if you want to interface this with other codes using effective field theories, we actually have to, you know, we have to come up with a standard how to exchange data and, and, and um, that uh, led us to define the Wilson coefficient exchange format, which was then implemented by developers of 10 different uh, open source tools or well, public codes, I should say. Um, and then uh, the Wilson package, uh, so general effective field theory tool, which developed out of, you know, originally a sub uh, module of Flavio. And then finally in 2019, we published a somehow overarching package for general likelihood analysis of effective field theory, which is like a user-friendly interface to, to all of these tools. And um, so um, having, having told you about this history, I want to now uh, have a brief intermezzo where I'm showing you, you know, in the notebook, just a few, a few functions from these, from these packages without going into details due to time constraints. 
just to give you a feeling of, of um, how this works. So, and I want to focus here just on Flavio, which is the, the first of these packages. All right, so Flavio, you, you import it. And then one of the basic objects in the package is an observable, which is a quantity which can be measured uh, in an experiment. So here, for example, um, I'm looking at the branching ratio of a D sub S meson decaying into a pair of muons. And if you just execute this in the Jupyter notebook, it will just pretty print some information about this. Um, and then you can use this uh, observable to compute predictions. So for instance, SM predictions give you, gives you the standard model prediction for this branching ratio, which is um, around three times 10 to the minus nine. But as you all know, and as also this controversy that I just mentioned demonstrates, um, a prediction is worth nothing without an uncertainty. So um, crucially, Flavio doesn't only implement functions with fixed values, but it also implements probability distributions, which allows you to, for instance, compute uncertainties of theoretical predictions. So here it tells you that the uncertainty of this number 3.7 is 0 0.14. All right, um, it also, apart from you know, being able to compute actually thousands of different observables and their uncertainties, it also contains plotting routines. So here, for example, here is a function which computes um, the error budget of this observable, not the total uncertainty, but you know, split into different sources from different parameters. And then there's a plotting function in the Flavio plot submodule, which plots a, a pie chart. And this looks like this. So now you have a pie chart with the different error contributions. <clears throat> Good, then uh, let me briefly tell you about Wilson. Um, it's, uh, well, I called it here a Smith Arm Swiss army knife of effective field theories beyond the standard model, which is actually true because one of my main collaborators on this was Swiss. Um, and what, what this package is for is to define points in effective field theory parameter space and use renormalization group methods and matching methods to transform between different renormalization scales or different um, effective field theories or different bases. And so for the experts here, I'm, I'm switching on a Wilson coefficient, um, a contribution to a Wilson coefficient, which is not present in the standard model, but which contributes to this decay B sub S to mu plus mu minus that I just mentioned and give it some value at some renormalization scale and some effective field theory and basis. It again pretty prints some information about this. And now I can compute the new physics prediction. So the prediction for this observable um, beyond the standard model um, as a function of these Wilson coefficients and divided by the standard model prediction, sorry. And I get, you know, 0.78. So uh, the branching ratio has become smaller. Um, so for the experts, if I would use a right-handed current, I would get the Wilson coefficient C7 prime Oops, lowercase, yep. And then the branching ratio would become larger than the standard model. Okay, um, then apart from, from you know, computing numbers, um, the actually much more you know, useful and, and um, important feature in my view is to be able to compute likelihoods. So um, Flavi has a likelihood module um, and they can compute experimental likelihoods of observables because it also contains a database of experimental measurements. So here let me define a likelihood uh, with a sim single observable, which is the branching ratio of the radiative B to axis gamma decay. And then, you know, here I'm just defining a function which returns the negative log likelihood as a function of parameters. Here I'm just using this default parameters and Wilson coefficients. And here I'm again using Wilson to um, modify one of these uh, Wilson coefficients that affects um, this decay. And now here comes the magic. This is what, what I really love about you know, open source and Python. I can just now simply import Minuit and uh, use Minuit to minimize this negative log likelihood starting uh, at the standard model point. So uh, you know, in 2007, we had to interface root with Mathematica in a very uh, complicated construction. Now I can just import Minuit and do Migrat and bam, here's the result. So the result is one plus minus nine times 10 to the minus three. 
So this this is really what I love about you know um, Python and open source. Another thing that made me very happy is that you know seeing that for example earlier this year the LHCB collaboration has presented an update of this um, measurement of this P2K star mu plus mu minus dk which had originally sparked this controversy, and now they are actually using our open source code to you know to produce likelihood contours in the space of Wilson coefficient, which I think is really a, a great example of, of um, open source. All right, so yeah, I mean, I think the conclusion of this part of the talk is that Python and high energy physics are really a perfect match also in theoretical physics. Um, but, you know, as I alluded to in the beginning, um, in practice, I think there are also some problems which are related not so much or not at all to the language or to the ecosystem, but actually to, to you know, to mentality in, in, uh, in the theory community. And I want to show you a few examples uh, to, to make you understand what I mean. So I think Python's full potential is, is really harnessed uh, when you embrace what I would call, or what, what many people call the open source paradigm, which means not just putting an, uh, you know, the source code of your package somewhere on the web, on the web but you know, being transparent, being transparent about the development, so having a repository where I can do a git blame and where I can see how the code evolves, but also transparency in decision making. You know, if you if you make some, if you reject a feature request, you know, then just say openly why. If there are bugs, just be open about them. Another one thing is you know to release early and often, and not treating software like a paper. You know, many people in the theory community treat software like a paper in the sense that you work on it, uh, you know, privately until you think it's finished, then you release it and stop working on it. But that I think is not how software should work. And finally, also to have a community working, working on, on a project. And in my opinion, in, in high energy physics phenomenology, there are actually few projects which really uh, stick to this paradigm. And they're mostly what, what, you know, people call public codes, which, you know, fulfill the first criterion, but not the others. Um, and I, I want to give you a few examples. I don't want to put anyone on the spot here or criticize anyone uh, particularly. I just want to want to give you some examples to, so, so you know what I mean. So for, for example, what often happens is when you want to download a code, there's no source code repository, but there's a download link. So you can download a tarball and then, so for example, in this case, you click on it, and then, okay, you need to provide your name and email address. Why? I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the authors here don't have bad intentions, but this is just one of the examples where, you know, um, I want to see how the, how the code evolved. I want to, to you know, to, to be able to access it freely. Another example is on the transparency of decision-making here. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, I, I realized that there was a very nice, uh, you know, interface format for, um, Lagrangians for fine, fine rules models actually, which is written in Python. And so I thought, well, that's great. I can add an interface to my code. Um, but then I realized, well, it doesn't work with Python 3. And this was 2016, right? So I, I wrote the developers that, well, it's not Python 3 compatible. They didn't have a repository. So I just downloaded their code, made it compatible with Python 2 and 3 and put everything in a public GitHub repository. Um, they were actually happy about it. Um, however, you know, then you know, there was some discussion and uh, a few commits because they didn't want to have dependency on non-standard library packages. And in the end, one year later, I just asked them whether they had actually decided to merge this or not. And they told me, well, you know, no, uh, because this format is based on Python 2 and there is no official support for Python 3. But they advised me to just, you know, take the code and do 2 to 3 which of course didn't help me because I wanted to have an interface in my library. And you know, I don't want to criticize these decisions, probably they had good reasons, but you know, just as an illustration how I think it should work. Um, if this discussion were made in a public you know, GitHub issue, then first of all, other people could comment on it. And secondly, my contribution would have not been lost because maybe now, you know, 2020, Python 2 has reached end of life maybe someone would decide to, to merge this Python 3 support back in. But, you know, with lack of transparency or openness, this contribution is just lost. So I'm, I'm, I see that I'm running out of time. So um, 
just uh, one final uh, example that I want to mention is um, an issue with citing code. So um, I can tell you that actually originally, I never intended to publish Flavio um, as a paper, to publish a companion paper, which is actually a common practice in, in phenomenology. Because I thought, well, when I publish this as a paper, then people will think that if they contribute to the project, they will only you know, add to my own citations and not get any credit for it. So I, I thought that this is actually obstructive to the open source paradigm. So I got myself a DOI from Zenodo. I tried to make this citable and inspire. Uh, I had a few email exchanges with Inspire, but it actually didn't work eventually because you know these citations didn't count uh, in the author's uh, in the author's citation count, and people kept asking me how do I cite your code. So I ended up um, submitting the uh, paper to a journal, and I want to show you an, an uh, you know extract from the referee report. Again, not to complain about it. I think you know um, the, the referee was probably right, but. To, to give you a sense of the mentality towards software in the phenomenology community. So the referee wrote um, that this document gives an overview of the features, but does not represent a manual, which is what I wrote in the abstract. And since I wrote this in the abstract, because I wanted to just have a short companion paper without describing every single function, because the code was constantly evolving, um, it's not a proper description of the code, and so it lacks a full description of the functionalities and a tutorial and, and so on and so forth. So I cannot recommend the manuscript for publication. Um, so the, the thing is that in the phenomenology community, the accepted practice is to develop a code, you know, not, not necessarily in the open, to describe all of its functions to great detail in a very long paper and then to put this on the web, the code and the paper, and then, you know, possibly continue developing it further. But, um, yeah, and I think that's, that's an approach to, to uh, software development, which is not very well suited for science. So um, I just want to share four ideas how I think the system could be improved. So first of all, I think, you know, this is of course unrealistic, but I, I think it would be nice if journals would actually enforce transparency on numerical analysis in phenomenology. So why, why should you be secretive about your code if the numerical results are your main, main, the main outcome of your paper? So I think science should be open and it should also be reproducible. That's a key point. And I think Python is actually perfectly suited for this. You can have a pip env environment with version locking, so you have perfectly reproducible environment and so on. Another thing is, I think some solution has to be found to, to make software contribution citable because for young, especially for young scientists, I think this is a problem. You contribute to an open source project and you're not getting credit for it. Um, also, you know, I think hiring committees should, should appreciate, um, you know, open source development as a, as a community service more, which at the moment, I think in the theory community is not really appreciated enough. And finally, um, I think advisors, uh, you know, should also consider that many of their young collaborators will actually end up not working in academia. So, you know, if you force them to work on your old uh, Fortran code, I, I think you're not doing them a good service because they will not be able to use this in their later professional careers. So I think this actually is a sort of re responsibility and it's also, you know, a great um, uh, uh, reason to actually use state-of-the-art tools. So, um, and in this way, I'm sure that Python can also start to play a more important role in the theory community. Okay, finally, you know, I just uh, wanted to end by saying that there's a, a tool I created uh, used by a couple of theorists, but I'm not using it anymore. So if there's a young, um, young researcher in the, in the audience who wants to have a simple first issue to solve in a HEP-related Python project, uh, it would be great if you could fix this issue, thanks. So sorry for going over time and I want to you know thank all of my collaborators who who worked on me uh, worked on Python with me. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. I, we obviously can't all give you a round of applause and the industry around the world, but it was really interesting. I think um, you really hit a few interesting points as well. I think obviously whilst you're sharing your screen, you can't see the chat, but you should have a look at the Zoom chat because you're obviously ringing a bell with a lot of people. 
Um, do you want to, I, I sent the link in the chat towards the bottom and if you click on there, you can see the presenter view for the questions and maybe if you are happy to share that screen, we can take, we've probably got time for a handful. So, sorry, I'm a bit slow. Where's the chat? Um. I'll send it. Um, otherwise, I can maybe. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm share myself. I can't see the chat. Um. Let me try this. Let me see if I can do. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can you ask a question in your in time? There you go. So I hope you can see this now. So the first question you have is about, oh, you only see that. Um, you have a, a question here at the top about the uh, proper open source projects as defined. I can't I'm really struggling to see my screen right now. <laughs> that doesn't help much. Uh, here we go. Uh, there you go. Good. Um, maybe if I stop sharing mine, but you know, for some reason the window, uh, this is strange. Hmm. Okay. Sorry. It doesn't show me the button to maybe I should. Okay. Here you go. Yeah. Just for the interest of time, I'll, I'll do this. So here you go. You can see the first question now. So since leaving, has oh, your now, view of, now I see it. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Yeah. Has your view of coding and HEP changed at all? And have there been tools and techniques that you've learned? that you pass on to your non-particle physics colleagues? That was a very highly upvoted question. Yeah, so um, the first um, question, my view of coding in HEP, well, I mean, you know, I haven't been gone so long. Um, so what, I, what I've been telling you now about my view of coding in HEP is what I've been feeling already uh, for several years. But, you know, to be honest, um, I'm, I feel like I'm, able to speak more openly about it now um, but you know, apart from that I think my view on coding hasn't really changed so much um, but concerning the second part yes definitely there are tools and techniques I've learned from high energy physics which I'm which I'm using a lot now which I'm benefiting a lot from and which I'm also sharing with other people um, this this uh, extends to techniques but also packages like you know I, I showed you uh, Minwit, I'm using Minwit for data science and things that have nothing to do with particle physics. And there are many examples like that. Thank you. Um, I can also see the chat actually. Uh, you had another question uh, here from Peter. One might be concerned that proper open source projects, as you define, as distinguished from public codes, require overhead that is not rewarded by the community. I guess you touched on this a little bit at the very end, so maybe this was yeah. put beforehand, but it's a very highly voted. Do you want to expand yeah. a little bit on what you, what you said there? I, I agree. Um, they require work that is not rewarded by the HEP, well, at least by the HEP theory community. That, that is certainly true. But, you know, I, I'm not so sure I would call it overhead because, you know, in my case, I have to say actually that um, I profited from this because, you know, it forced me to, you know, to, to have a more structured approach and, 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 and so on. And um, I think in the end, my, my you know, my uh, pro productiveness, my productivity actually benefited from doing everything openly. And I've also had people, you know, colleagues, pointing out bugs in my code, which I, I would have never found myself. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I, I'm not sure I would call it overhead, but it's certainly true that it's work, which is at the moment in many cases, not properly rewarded. Yes, it's true. Okay, I, I, I think we have unfortunately move on. It's a shame we've got so many yeah. interesting questions here. I'll make sure we get these questions. You can, we'll keep them up for a very little while, because I'll take them down for the next talk, but we'll copy them should over I, to Should Slack. I answer them in the chat? Uh, what we'll do is we'll copy them into Slack. You can actually reply to these messages, yeah. I think, already, but uh, we will clear this for the next presentation. So I'll leave them up for another okay. five, 10 minutes, and then we can transfer them to Slack. So thank you again, David. That was really great. Really fantastic. Thanks. Thank you for 